Okay, welcome to Music at Queen's and uh, you're joining us for another in our series of online um, conversations with artists whom we had hoped to bring you during the autumn 2020 season. Uh, we still hope to bring them to you when we're allowed to welcome audiences back into the Sonic Lab and the Hearty Room. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we want to um, keep them in mind. And so with that in mind, I'm today uh, hooked up to talk to one of uh, the UK's leading cellists, Kate Gould, who very kindly joins us from London. She's a solo artist in her own right, and also, as we'll be hearing, a member of the London Bridge Trio. And uh, she was to come to us particularly as part of a planned celebration of Beethoven's chamber music during his year, uh, his 250th year. Um, well, it's likely to be his 251st year by the time we get to that. Um, but Kate, welcome and thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, thank you. Yes, a year late, but still very worth celebrating. I think Beethoven's probably my desert island composer, so I was really, really looking forward to coming and playing those two sonatas for you. Absolutely. Well, you shall. And um, before we get on to that, I wanted to just to ask you a bit about the lockdown itself. Um, just in the last 24 hours, um, I received a very hard hitting article from a friend and former uh, Queen's artist in residence, Sophia Rahman, uh, which she's written online about the plight of uh, particularly freelance musicians in the UK. Um, I mean, you've been at the sharp end of this. I mean, can you tell us a little about the effect of the last six months on your normal working life? Yes, it's, it's um, for all of us, it's, it, it's been incredibly bleak, um, financially, but also um, who we are. And we don't, we're not, we don't just do music, we are musicians by nature. So um, to have that sort of taken away from us, apart from playing on our own at home, has been um, quite an eye-opener, actually. I think it's, it's been um, quite telling for how important it is to us, it really, in, in our souls, um, and incredibly sad. I've done a few things back at work over the summer, um, which were quite an experience having had nothing at all. Uh, we were all so incredibly pleased to see each other going into a film studio to record the music for The Crown, the next series of The Crown, and then some English chamber orchestra concerts which were streamed or recorded um, combination. I made a CD with, with the English chamber orchestra and um, at Cadogan Hall and then two days ago, um, a streamed concert which had no audience. And what, as, as my first streamed concert um, to an empty concert hall, as I've been watching on the television uh, with the proms, what really struck me was how everyone's just playing their heart out. They're so pleased to be playing music again for other people. And even though there wasn't an audience there, you're, you're aware um, that this is going out to people. And I think that in a way, having it all, having been sort of stripped of it all, I feel that people are just playing their hearts out and desperate to, to do what we do and share what, what we're used to sharing. And, and I don't know, there's, there's an extra intensity. I was, I was glad to discover I had adrenaline in the concert, which I was wondering without an audience. Um, there was that feeling of this is a concert, every second counts, every, every second has meaning that you're projecting to the people that listen and also to the, your colleagues around you. You know, we were, we were creating on the spot, which is what you can't do online. We were responding to each other and you, you're just, I think all of the qualities of live music has been, have been heightened by having it taken away. I mean, that's very, very striking, a very moving picture you draw. Um, but I suppose the essence of 
chamber music in particular, but I mean, all concerted music is really closeness and interaction. And that is what the virus or the threat of the virus has taken an, uh, an ax to really. So uh, we're really threatened, aren't we? I mean, in a very basic level, just proximity and sight lines and things like that, which are very important to musicians, but which some of uh, the people looking uh, joining us today might not uh, be aware of. I mean, I noticed um, the other day watching um, a television interview with uh, a colleague in the Ulster Orchestra and the second violins during rehearsals, and they asked her what the, how it was. They're playing basically distanced on the floor of one of the halls in Belfast. And she said, well, the problem is that I normally listen to the cellos here and they're over there. And I'm really, uh, I mean, that sounds as if, you know, if you're listening to something, it doesn't matter where it is, but of course it does, doesn't it? So the actual distancing is obviously difficult, isn't it? But for chamber music, I mean, it's, a, it's almost a, a deal breaker, isn't it? To start spacing players from one another. Is that going to be a huge problem for, for your operations and trios and things like that? Yeah, you're absolutely right that it makes a difference. Um, so it's all about adjusting at the moment. This ECO concert didn't have a conductor, so it was led by Stephanie Gonley and it was all about sight lines. So you could have, especially the winds, they were so far back having to look at her movements and anticipate everything in order not to be late. It's always like that anyway, but it's more so at the moment. and. Um, it was a Mozart program, and um, I'm used to really hearing the basses um, and trying to put my sound inside that, and yet I could hardly hear them. So it, you're having to turn up your listening a lot. Um, on the other hand, I think that there's, I think I, I might be wrong, but I've sensed this watching other orchestras at the proms as well. Um, there's a lot more movement, visual movement going on in order to make it work. Um, I, for one, was principal cello and I was two metres away from my other two. There's no sharing of music stands, there's no desk partner. Um, so I was two metres away from the other two cellists and then the basses were even behind them. So I was just leading everything and just trying to, make, to be as clear as possible, which I think they appreciated and Stephanie was incredibly clear. So there, on the one hand, yes, it's a huge challenge. On the other, it's not impossible. Um, you can just listen even more while you're playing. Um, the first thing that I did since lockdown was, was going in to do this um, TV session for The Crown. And there was a moment, you know, none of us had seen anyone else for months. And there was a moment where the cellos had a chorale to play, a very quiet, calm chorale, which is all about blending the sound, usually phrasing together each phrase, just like a spoken chorale phrase, as if you're singing together. Um, and I couldn't believe we were, we were a good two meters away from each other. And yet we seemed to be cohesive as a group. Um, it was a very sensitive, I think the quiet moments are probably easier for that than the loud actually, because you're not making a big sound yourself, you can hear each other more. Um, just a few body movements and some kind of magic that takes over when you play music with other people. We, we could feel it, you know, where, the, where we wanted to phrase to and then releasing off together. It felt like a real group, which was quite interesting. I think we, I, Yes, it's much harder to play together, but it's certainly not impossible. Yeah, and it's, it must be very tiring when you stop. Did you not come out of those? I mean, I feel quite tired just listening to your description of the kind of intensity or, you know, with all the body language and everything. When you stop doing that, sometimes you think, oh, I feel so tensed up and everything. But maybe this is a new way of, I mean, Worst case scenario, maybe, um, you know, players are going to have to learn this kind of new language of communication for the foreseeable future. Or maybe, you know, it'll all go away or whatever. But, uh, I mean, it's a huge ask. And, of course, pa in parallel with the very interesting musical um, aspects you're telling us, which I think a lot of our 
um, audience, people joining us will not perhaps have thought about. In parallel with that, there's the economic nightmare. Uh, you know, it's hard enough to make the kind of music that we play and write sort of pay its way anyway. Um, so, you know, goodness knows. Um, I'm interested to go back a bit um, because musicians' lives are always really interesting, <coughs> I think, to audiences. Um, I mean, I'd like to hear a little about how you started out. So um, you you grew up in Winchester, right? And I'm interested in that because for 10 years I was also at school in Winchester um, longer ago. But uh, so I know it, when I was there, um, it was a very fertile place. And in fact, um, when I was talking on one of these online talks not so long ago about my own development, I was kind of tracing my own love of chamber music to concerts that actually happened during my teens in Winchester. So I'm sort of wondering if it was a fertile place for you, um, you know, or whether you had to go elsewhere for your, for your uh, you know, musical enlightenment. Yes, actually, it was a fertile place, I would say, um, partly because of Winchester College, because they had a series when I was younger, um, which then stopped for many years. And during that time, is is when I set up the festival. So there was a void um, for a while. Um, and they've, they've restarted it for about the last maybe year and a half. They've restarted, I think it's called the International Visiting Artists or, or something at Winchester College in the New Hall. Yeah. That was a corner, the New Hall concerts were a cornerstone of my life. And in fact, um, once or twice, twice in fact, I've returned uh, with the Schubert Ensemble for, for chamber music of mine in the hall where I learned a lot of the great repertoire, which was for me was very moving. Some of the same people are still in the audience and everything. So um, I know exactly what you're talking about. So that's really wonderful um, to hear. And um, I mean, you're within reach of London and other centres, of course. And so I can imagine that you, you heard a lot of live music then, it's very important. Um, for players developing. Uh, I wanted to ask about the role of the Chamber Orchestra of Europe because a lot of our listeners and uh, concert goers may not be aware of the unusual role that the Chamber Orchestra of Europe plays amongst a whole swathe of uh, leading British instrumentalists of um, the middle generation, as it were. I mean, a kind of huge um, family of, uh, perhaps not huge, but a um, very distinguished family of players that have in common this connection with this orchestra. I mean, was were you uh, in at the beginning of that and was that a huge kind of formative thing for you? I wasn't in at the beginning. Um, I joined I joined in 2000 um, and I think the orchestra has been going since the 80s. Um, but I, you, when you join, you immediately become very aware of who, who were the founder members and what they have to give, to pass over. Um, they, it was originally mainly a bardo and then Harnencourt, Nicolas Harnencourt, became a huge, huge influence on the orchestra. And those Beethoven recordings, Beethoven symphony recordings are still quite legendary, I think. Um, and the, the way that, that the, the way that he installed um, this more spoken language and playing with timing and silences and um, a very gestural approach is hopefully what, what the orchestra still carries over, whoever they work with, because it, it was, it was a, a very, very important musical step. Um, actually, my husband wasn't a founder member, but he's, he's, he started a long while before me in the orchestra and lots of our friends. So I'm very aware of that key group that you're talking about. And, and it, it does feel a bit special, but we are quite unknown, I think, in the UK. Um, you sort of go off to do your special thing in Europe and, uh, and we don't play here that much, um, which is a shame, but it's mainly a European tour orchestra. And that's still happening. It's still part of your your life, still in your diary, is it? Yeah. So you renew those relationships with those people, which must have a huge effect on the rest of what you do with chamber music and things like that. Yes, it does. It's it's 
it's an incredible um, coming together of like-minded musicians. And um, I often, as a mother, I often kind of wish I had something here that I could commit myself to, but it's very, once you've joined CUE, it's extremely hard to leave it because the music making is on such a heightened level. In a good way, yes. You well, make it sound like Hotel California, you can check out the, <laughs> you can't leave, but you don't want to leave, yeah. Don't want to leave, even if yeah. you, practical reasons, but you, it's very hard to leave for other reasons. Absolutely. And just for those who don't know, I mean, it's not like other orchestras, uh, am I not right, in that in the players have much more, of, have traditionally had much more of a kind of role in, in the orchestra. I mean, in, in that way, it seems to me to resemble more a kind of chamber ensemble than the kind of orchestra where you're employed and you just turn up and do what you're told. Absolutely, yes. And there's, there's an ethos um, that's quite different to other orchestras as well. The principal players don't get a higher fee, for example, than the rest of the section. Um, and there's no principal conductor. It's a project-based orchestra um, that's always, even though it would be very helpful in other ways, in, in, in a kind of promotional selling the orchestra way to have, to be connected to one big name, because it's all of our business is all about the big names. Um, the COE has really stuck to their guns and just work with special conductors with whom they have special relationships. And um, we've, we've got um, a way of making them feel connected to the orchestra just by um, naming them associate, I think it's friends or a friend of the Chamber Orchestra of Europe. It, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a, instead of a, a position, it's more like we, a, a token of our, appreciation we we really value working with you and hope you do the same i mean they don't get as much money from us i think the soloists and the um conductors as with other orchestras other big named orchestras um but it's all about the level and quality of the music and the experience on the stage which is quite exceptional of course well no, to be associated would indeed be an honor um it made me wonder though about um, orchestral life generally. I mean, you said that it's so hard to leave, but is it also the case that it kind of would spoil you for any other kind of orchestral existence um, in terms of, you know, looking for the security of just, you know, joining an orchestra uh, in the UK, a more traditionally based orchestra? Has, how does that kind of, have, have you ever been involved in that kind of life? And uh, is that ruled out for you now? It's a quite a pertinent question, actually. Um, I do quite a lot of guest leading of the, just going in as a guest principal cello. And um, I really, really enjoy that. And you, you're, there's a kind of, in a, on the one hand, there's a, a freedom of going into a group that you, you don't, you're not involved in their politics and you can just go in and enjoy the music and the experience. But on the other hand, um, lots, of, lots of guest players talk about the imposter syndrome and you, you wonder, am I actually fitting in? I'm supposed to be leading this section, but I'm, I'm the stranger, which is quite unusual. And... Um, I also, I, what I find is that I, from playing mainly chamber music and in COE, um, it's natural and necessary even to be quite extrovert. Whereas when I go into the UK orchestras, I will admit that sometimes I feel a bit like a fish out of water because of that um, more dynamic, not, I mean, I don't want to, Put them down but I just I don't feel like I fit in quite as easily as in my normal role. Yes I mean it's possible to to argue that there's something um, that doesn't suit everybody the idea of having to play like the person in front of you as it were with the kind of uh, instruction sort of filtering down and um, you know that suits some kinds of player I suppose and and not others, but obviously it's very important for the traditional result of a big orchestra playing 
um, you know, romantic repertoire or something, but it, I can see that it would be very hard to adopt that ethos, whether you're at the front, you know, or whether you're at the back kind of receiving the information it must be very hard after a, a lifetime, you know, after a work, working more independently. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I really value it and appreciate that it, you do need to sound like a group and, and, and I, I would want that, but it's, it's just the kind of, I think it's, it's just how wide your range of expression is. Like if, you, if the whole section's like that, then you can, but it, it's, a, yeah, it's a type of playing. But of course, you don't know them, uh, as you say, if you're a guest, and that must be a very different kind of thing. Um, I mean, how much is chamber music and its famous chemistry that brings people together? How much is that a musical thing? And how much is that a personal thing? I mean, I'm just interested because, you know, you hear all these stories of groups, particularly in the past, um, quartets that don't get on with each other, but love to play together and they have nothing else. I mean, there is a kind of innately musical chemistry or, or can you get on, can you have very close friends, but, but it doesn't work in a group? I, I wonder about all that kind of thing. Yes, you can, you can. I think um, whether a chamber group works or not, isn't necessarily can't necessarily be judged by whether you argue in rehearsals. Um, if there's a, I think there can be really healthy discussions in rehearsals about how to approach a certain passage, say. Um, and that's actually quite necessary for, to, to push up against some different ideas to, to create something strong. Um, if you just agreed on everything, it could quite, easily be a little bit too placid or reserved as a performance but not everybody on a personal level as opposed to the playing level is comfortable with disagreeing and that's where it becomes tricky so I think the Amadeus Quartet for example benefited hugely from the way they disagreed they they would apparently they talked about it in a positive way yes yes it's Yes, we seem like we're fighting almost in a rehearsal, but but the result um, is part of that. It's it's so personal whether you're whether you're happy to, to to actually disagree and comfortable to see where that takes you, and lots of people aren't. It's a really really tricky one. So it in terms of friends, it's obviously a little bit risky playing with friends, or especially family members because uh, you, you start disagreeing when you don't usually disagree so. yes i mean if we take this outside music i mean there's good disagreement and i mean as in um, marriage or family or anything isn't it there's as we all know there's sort of positive disagreement where you sort of kick something around and you eventually decide what you want and then there's the kind of disagreement that that is kind of insidious and, and you know I've known chamber groups as well where you know just everything is wrong between x and y and therefore um, that's sort of negative as it were um, and it just underlines the human interaction behind chamber music which is why you know as a composer I find it so you know to be part of something and again it's something which this virus situation is attacking you know it's attacking collaboration and we're having to be ever more resourceful in getting around that and so on um kind of paring it down further what about solo playing because you will eventually come to us um, and play on your own um in string terms with uh pianist daniel tong um do you feel a kind of uh, relief when you when you have a project where it's just you playing cello or or do you miss uh, or you know do you miss people I'm I'm asking this partly but as a kind of preamble to to hearing you um, playing a short extract from unaccompanied Bach um, and some people I know um, certainly my uh, my teacher in Winchester was one of them um, feel I think that there's a kind of 
there's a kind of uh, protective strength in having at least a group and that sometimes being solo or, or just being exposed like that can sometimes feel very lonely or intimidating. Is that a, a thing you recognise? I think other players present on the stage do give you a backbone. You, you, when you play unaccompanied, um, you're searching for a kind of inner silence more. It's you. It can it can feel more nerve wracking, but in a way you've got complete freedom. That's the beauty of it. Um, you can really lose yourself and not have to. You can, not have to sort of react basically to something somebody else has said with the music. Um, I mean, playing Beethoven sonatas, especially with Dan, because I play with him so much, Daniel Tong, um, it is rather wonderful how we have to say very little in the rehearsals. Um, you really can just react in, through the playing instead of having to make decisions. Um, that's assuming you basically are happy with the same tempo, and, but in terms of moments of breathing and taking time um, or moving forward or, or um, finding the contrasts in the expression um, with, a, with a player, with one other player that, that you're used to and really happy with, it does happen very naturally. Um, and then the more people you add, probably the more discussion comes into the rehearsal. Um, it, it's less natural. Whereas um, with playing on a company Bach, I mean, which cellist hasn't been playing on a company Bach in lockdown? It's, it's, it's kind of like our Bible. It, we, six suites that are all on such an incredible level of invention and emotion and um, uh, sort of wisdom, really. The, the, the writing to cover, Bach manages to cover all the voices in one line so you've got implied dialogues and a melody with pointed bass line and harmony harmony in, in between you you can always imagine what the harmony is even when you're playing the upper line you could you, you're aware of, of the pedal maybe that's pervading over those six bars or or just where there's dissonance where there's release and and um the, the, the level of these six suites basically means that all cellists can devote their lives and never still find that they're not bored of playing Bach. They're always discovering new things and um, always wishing, striving to, to work out their best version. And every single cellist plays it in such a different way as well. It's just, it's just remarkable. I mean, I want to pay tribute to your description there. I wish I could bottle that little uh, encapsulation that you gave there about the implied harmony and the, and the dialogue and, and so on, the sequences in the line, because you just described so brilliantly what it is that brings us back to this music again and again. Uh, I mean, I know you have thought about it a lot, but, uh, you know, congratulations. You should write that down. Um, do you... I mean, because you don't have that kind of thing of a pianist or a quartet on stage with you, I mean, do you just have a conversation with yourself when you're preparing these about, you know, about the music? I mean, that's where I was supposed the isolation or loneliness might come in that, you know, you've got, am I doing this right? Uh, you know, am I, is this a good tempo? That That's a conversation with yourself, really, is it? Is It really is, yeah. Um, obviously, when you hear yourself recorded, it helps a lot because you suddenly have a stronger idea. Um, when I recorded the E flat suite for the Penarth Chamber Music Festival, um, it was a, it had been a long while since I'd actually heard myself playing, but I was forced to in in this experience. Of, um, and I suddenly wanted the fast movements lighter and faster, and I and I wanted um, to sort out the 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 freedom that was distorting the rhythm or the tempo or the, the, there are lots of adjustments can be made when you hear yourself because you can't always judge everything just from practicing and 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 talking to yourself but yes there's a huge amount of talking to yourself but I, that gave me another thought about playing and the company bark and in a way it encapsulates what a musician's role is because in a way we're we're like actors 
trying to present different characters and roles um, and telling a story. And that's, that's exactly um, what, Thank you. exactly what our responsibility is really. So we can, so we can have these conversations with ourselves through the music as well. A, a voice that argues or, 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 or a voice that's contrasting or, or, or complementing all of it. It's our, it's our role not just to feel it, but to present it so that that's clear for the audience. And that's what interpretation is really, I think. Absolutely. Well, we have the chance now to hear you playing um, from earlier this summer. Um, and I think we, we can hear the prelude and uh, the courant from uh, the fourth suite. Um, is that right? The, um, those are two contrasted movements. Um, the the current obviously is a dance. The prelude, what kind of mood does it set out? Because the moods of each of the preludes seem to me very different. Yes, and I think that the E flat is is in a way one of the harder ones to pinpoint. Um, it's all broken chords. It's taking you on a on a harmonic journey through something really lacking melody. It's the least melodious of all of the sweet preludes. But of course, that is that is also true of one of Bach's most famous pieces, the C major prelude from the beginning of the 48 Preludes and Fugues. So um, he's got away with it before. So, uh, um, you know, it, it, I suppose that was a function really of the prelude or the richer car in Baroque music, wasn't it? To kind of warm up, to kind of try a, a chord sequence. And in Bach, that's elevated to uh, a huge level. So let's hear um, now an excerpt from Kate Gould playing uh, two movements from Bach's uh, E-flat suite for unaccompanied cello.
So there we heard two movements from the suite in E-flat by Bach, played by our guest, Kate Gould. Um, I'd like to hear a little about your your sort of main trio gig, which is the uh, London Bridge Trio. Um, how did that come about? 
Well, the group actually has quite a long history um, in that we used to be a, a larger ensemble and we were called the London Bridge Ensemble. Um, and it coincided with my years as, as a member of the Leopold String Trio. Um, so they sort of coexisted for a while. Um, and as the, when, the, when the Leopolds decided to retire, if you like, or just quit um, after 21 years, so that was plenty of string trio playing for me, um, uh, I could really focus on this very different beast where particularly playing piano trios, the cello has a lot more chance to sing and, and be in, it's, piano trios feel a, a little bit more like playing sonatas, but with another string player there you've often got the melody um whereas in a string trio i was often accompanying and supporting and playing bass lines which were incredibly intricate and challenging but a bit less um enjoyable in a way so yeah the the, the london bridge trio it has had sadly many carnations because we've we've had some wonderful players come and go from the group but the latest carnation we're extremely happy with and feel very comfortable rehearsing with um, in, in terms of what we were talking about before. Um, and David Adams has now joined me and Daniel Tong. Um, and we absolutely love it. You know, we're at the stage in our lives where we can't, we don't live in the same towns even, and we can't rehearse all the time. We can't even give concerts all the time, but we feel it's, it's really worth dedicating a lot of time and energy to make it work to do that traveling to rehearsals um uh, because by this stage in life you know you really do realize when you've got a good thing and it feels very lovely to make music together we've been uh, working on a recording project um our second disc of the light circle has just come out um there are going to be three discs in all and the discs um feature not only Robert Schumann and Felix Mendelssohn, but also Felix Mendelssohn's sister, uh, Fanny Mendelssohn, and Robert Schumann's wife, Clara Schumann. So they, they all wrote trios. Um, and we're, there are a few fillers of small pieces um, for violin and piano, or cello and piano as well, but it's basically all, of, all four of their, of their, cello, of their uh, piano trio works. And that's been a great pleasure and really a good, great thing for the, for the group as well. I mean, what a joy to be able to work in such repertoire. Um, I mean, it seems to me that through the 19th century, particularly in the trio, the quartet and the string quartet, the cello kind of finds its, it sort of hits the straps, it finds its voice, as it were. And... Um, you know, even in places in the Beethoven trios, you know, maybe there's so much going on in the piano and the violin that maybe as a cellist, you're having a, you're not always having the, quite the same kind of ride. Whereas the, uh, the emancipation of the instrument and, and its role in Mendelssohn, Schumann, Brahms supremely is, is incredible, isn't it? I mean, it must, it must be, it, so fulfilling to be right at the middle of that sound. I don't know if can you be at the middle of a sound. It, it seems to me like the core of the trio, and um, that must make it also um, quite a particular business to balance um, with a violin. I mean, when you play, I mean, your sister's a violinist, so you have a long experience of playing cello and violin. Um, I mean, are they all different? Is it is it difficult in a trio to to kind of to match cello and violin? I mean, can it go wrong, as it were? Yes, it can go wrong. I, it, it doesn't it doesn't just play itself. Um, obviously, when you're well suited naturally as players, it, it's it's it helps a great deal. Um, yes, I know what you mean. You're in. It, I mean, many even recordings of of many trios are three soloists coming together. Um, but I think it does make a difference when you're a regular group and you, 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 you really have a sound together. Absolutely. And there's a lot of talk in rehearsals about sort of the piano voicing in terms of the, the string lines. I mean, gosh, especially in something like Schumann, where I'm very often, um, it's a fantastically active cello part, but it's very often 
in in the same octave as this and playing the same line as this as left hand of, of the piano um and and deciding kind of who who needs to lead that in in the sound is is all very much part of the interpretation and if we all just went for it it would be quite smudgy to be honest especially in schumann um is the texture is is paramount yes i mean <laughs> i like the way you put that if we all just went for it because um what was behind my slightly odd question about you know can it go wrong does does every cello and violin you know does it always work was um by way of thinking about our other musical excerpt that uh, i'd like to share um which is the london bridge trio although not in its current uh, format because um we don't uh, we don't yet have david adams so this is a few years ago um with tams and whaley cohen playing violin what really struck me was the complete equality of the voices and when one thinks that acoustically the cello I mean, it perhaps doesn't have the sort of cutting edge in register of either the violin, which often goes very high, chamber music, or of course the piano with its kind of glittering upper register. And yet none of that is a factor. And I was, you know, looking at this marvelous um, result and thinking, you know, this looks so easy, but um, it can't be taken for granted. That was really why I asked. Um, so just tell us what this uh, excerpt is. It, um, it's, it's from that Leipzig circle, in fact, isn't it? Yes, that's right. The Mendelssohn, um, his, his second piano trio in C minor, completely extraordinary work. It's an outpouring of, of heart and passion. Um, but I, I love the C minor because it, it's, it has such a sort of um, mysterious and gritty um, opening the theme the theme is actually again quite unmelodic but all about weaving around and like you can imagine the, the the drama at the beginning of a of a dark scene in a film um where it's all about anticipation and, and tension and what 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 where's this going to go and and it, it is an extremely exciting first movement so it's, it is one of my favorites but but you you're absolutely right that that balance is a tricky one and you can often find that in a certain concert hall and with certain players the um the cello can't be heard quite enough in my opinion <laughs> but um luckily dan is incredibly sensitive of touch on the piano and and we do talk about that well let us hear this uh now and I must just say, for me, a particular joy in this piece, and it's just stuffed full of them, um, is the return of that idea you mentioned, when Mendelssohn just can't resist or showing off a bit, and he has the cello and the violin playing the returning theme at half speed while it's going on at the right speed in the piano. I hope I've got that the right way around. Um, you know, he's just so on top of his material. Um, and, you know, because the whole thing sounds so effortless, it's easy to miss those marvellous little tricks, um, you know, which in lesser hands might not uh, come off. It all sounds so wonderfully fluent. So here's the first movement of the Mendelssohn Trio now, played by the London Bridge Trio. Thank you. Thank you. 
So we've just heard the first movement of the Mandelson second trio, C minor, and um, that was played by the London Bridge Trio, and at the heart of it, uh, today's guest, Kate Gould. Um, I said at the beginning that uh, we're talking to Kate because, um, sadly, we've had to defer um, this as our other lunchtime concerts in Queens, and we look forward to um, a slightly delayed celebration of Beethoven sonatas um, and I want to move on to those if I may. I think I'm right that we're talking about sonatas for piano with cello accompaniment. Is that not how they were published? Um, I hesitate to ask a cellist without being kind of pelted with something but I had a feeling that was what it said on the cover. Um, there's certainly a lot for the piano to do isn't there but you, you, know, you wouldn't agree with that. The parts are incredibly equal. Um, I just wouldn't, I, I, you're, I think you might be partly right, but I think it says on the cover, um, sonata for pianoforte and violoncello. So it's not with cello accompaniment, no. Not no. I knew it was something which doesn't really describe what they're like because, I mean, on the contrary, as you say, the cello role is enormous. And um, what I love about this particular sonata, which was uh, sort of behind my um, planning for you to play, uh, you know, particularly, what I love about it is the way it seems to solve the kind of innate problem that I referred to a, a few minutes ago of the possible imbalance of just sound between the kind of muted tenor voice of the cello and the kind of potential brightness of the piano. Um, somehow, the duo relationship, the equality is just so perfect here. So whatever Beethoven put on the cover, he's absolutely nailed it with the relationship between the two instruments. But I grew up uh, thinking this was a real stinker of a piece for both instrumentalists. I mean, is it especially virtuosic? The, this sonata is Beethoven's, well, it's his middle period. He wrote two sonatas in an earlier period. And this is the central sonata where he's he's now absolutely brought the cello into, a, as you say, a more of a soloistic role. Um, 
they're all still called for pianoforte and cello, but um, in this case, it really is equal. I'd say the earlier ones, there is a feeling of the, a little, little bit more piano domination, as there is in the early piano trios, um, where the, he's, he's, even Opus One piano trios, Beethoven is the first to take, even though it's very much accompaniment, there's, there are then just moments where the cello is in the limelight more than any other composer has achieved. And um, uh, this sonata in A major, Opus 69, um, is absolutely using that A string singing role where it's the soloistic instrument. It's moved away from that bass role entirely. I mean, obviously there's, there's, there are some bass lines, it's swapping around, but it, it's, it's what you would call more virtuosic. It's, it's, it goes high and it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a singing role for the cello. Absolutely. Absolutely like to play. <laughs> and he has, uh, in this sonata, done something which seems quite traditional to other middle period pieces, certainly the C major piano sonata, the Waldstein, in that the slow movement isn't really a slow movement, it's a kind of upbeat, it's an anacrusis to the finale. Uh, I mean, I don't want to, to play it down, but he there are pieces in which the slow movement has this kind of interlude function, aren't there? Um, which must be a challenge interpretation wise anyway, because, you know, with a huge adagio, you can kind of, you know, you've got a, a great kind of uh, banquet to lay out. Whereas when something is prefatory to a big finale, I suppose it's a different kind of challenge. You've got to be in the moment, but it, you've also got to change the mood very suddenly. Well, I think in the case of this sonata, the reason it feels in perfect balance is because the nature of the slow move, of, of the first movement theme and the whole movement isn't something rather fast. The, the opening is in minims and is, is, is rather pensive and thoughtful. Um, and in a way, the central movement of that sonata is the first movement um, emotionally. It has a slowness about it. Um, and then what he manages to do with that theme through that movement, take it to so many kind of life feelings um, in, its, in its range. Um, so that simple major, incredibly simple opening gets transformed into the minor. Um, it becomes one minute fragile, the next minute incredibly stormy fortissimo with semiquavers, turbulent semiquavers underneath. Um, and and it, it, that first movement to me is, is, is it, it sort of, it, it's everything. <laughs> it's so, it's so worldly. And um, I, th I think that's why it seems in perfect balance that we have this very beautiful and quite understated slow introduction to the last movement. I wouldn't want another, I wouldn't want another super meaningful uh, slow movement there, actually. Yeah, that, that describes the geography beautifully. And uh, I must say that, you know, the origin of our invitation to you to come and play at Queen's was in fact hearing you play this uh, sonata almost exactly a year ago from, from when we speak, where I instantly thought, well, I have a concert series, this is going in it. And um, I, that, reminds me that uh, as we sit here we well you would normally be in North Oxfordshire running your own uh, festival with your sister Lucy Gould in um, Hawley uh, the Ironstone Festival and uh, I'm assuming that that isn't possible this year and last year I was lucky enough to be there as well and probably would have been this year. Um, is, are there plans there? this year sadly not it's not it's not really a festival that's on that scale that we could have a big online presence um whereas with winchester festival in the spring we're still absolutely planning to to do some live concerts and um, whether that's fully streamed um and no it will be fully streamed but whether we get actual audience in or not it, there will be concerts in a venue um we just don't know how and what yet so um no ironstone the, the september festival sadly we're just having a year of a, a year of rest well there's no disgrace at all 
in that because we've lost so many things um, that perhaps things that have survived in some form um, are the exception even now and that's entirely understandable. Um, it struck me knowing that festival and loving it that two very important things for the, the festival anywhere in the world I suppose seem to be the, the venue and its acoustic and the local community and both of those absolutely come together uh, in the Iron Stone Festival, is that right? Absolutely, and that's very much um, because of the wonderful family friends that run it, um, Chris and Tessa Howell, because they they are a huge, they have a huge presence in their village and they have friends everywhere and they've, they've basically brought all of their friends to the festival um, and got them involved in the meals. Oh, sorry. My, I'm, I need to plug plug in this actually, just a sec. Um, the, the large, the large trestle table meals that we have um, at the end of each concert, where the whole village sits and eats together, which is just an extraordinary thing to organise. Just bear with me while I plug my device in. Sorry, it's just said it's going to run out of battery. Okay, yes. So yeah, so it's very, very unusual actually that festival. It really feels like a, a friendly event. Um, I realised there was something very unusual when I realised that members of the audience were kind of lining up behind the bar in the interval to, to act as impromptu bar staff and uh, kind of dispensing drinks. And that little insignificant detail told me a huge amount about the ownership of the music. I was very moved. I mean, I've been twice, but I was very moved to see the, the level, you know, they weren't just sitting there in rows saying, you know, uh, okay, so what is this music? You know, you play it, we'll listen. It, everybody was absolutely owning this thing. They were putting it on because they wanted it. And, you know, to a composer with all the kind of isolation and, uh, loss of ownership that goes with with new music that was very moving to see that and so long may it continue and flourish and return next year thank you so much um kate for for, for all those thoughts um we're really really grateful to you for bearing with us while we deal with the the, the viral delay um to your invitation to come and play and um as with all our other artists, um, you know, we feel tantalizingly close to being able to plan live events for uh, our very faithful and regular concert audience, but um, we're all in the same boat, uh, and that bo is a boat of uncertainty. And so as soon as we can uh, bring you and uh, Daniel Tong and two Beethoven sonatas to Queens, we shall do so. In the meantime, very many thanks for joining us and for sharing so many insights into cello and chamber music uh, and um, musical art more widely. Thank you very much. Thank you.